Yeah, we're Sometimes. like guys. So I I played like just like a thousand or so hands of cash games, and like I got my ass kicked, guys. Like like destroyed. Um, you did, were... did fine. You did fine. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, like the the the, the thing is. There were quite a few spots where I was like, I don't really know what your range is supposed to be here. I bet you it's tighter than I'm used to. <laughs> like, and there's some things that I'm used to in tournaments where ranges are so wide where you can like, well, a lot of a lot of MTTs are about like attacking minimum defense frequencies and 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 accumulating chips with fold equity and winning those small pots. And it seems like, tell me if I'm wrong, is cash games. You know, it's really more about like how you're playing in the big pots, right? Okay, so I, I you told you told me that I should tell you when you're wrong. So uh, I would say you're wrong. <laughs> ah, <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> now, I mean, it it depends, right? But you know what? What you really notice, what you really notice when you start playing, I think especially the jump from 500 zoom to 1k, 2k you really notice that the good wrecks, they take every single pot very seriously. So, um, yeah, and, and I would say that's pretty important because that obviously all affects your win rate. That's the most significant change for sure. Mm -hmm. I guess what I mean though is I, I, I've, I think MTT players might be more front heavy in their aggression mm -hmm. than, 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 than cash game players might be. And... Mm -hmm. I was wondering, like, if you thought that was a common leak that MTT players have, for instance, or what do you think are the common links that MTT players have? Okay, so first of all, I would say uh, definitely playing way too wide. So um, did you check out the new ranges we have on bbzpoke.com? Uh, plug right there. I will, actually. <laughs> nice, nice plug, dude. You're, you're killing it. You're I'm killing done. it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so so yeah, we got we got new ranges for, for you guys watching. Me and Yago solved some cash ranges. We're getting out new ones out there. You can check it out on the website. And um yeah, I would say the most noticeable thing for sure is pre-flop people, MTT players are just way too wide. And and that's kind of understandable because in MTTs, you have the antis, you have no rake, you're supposed to do a lot of flatting. But yeah, like Lex was checking out, I, I think Lex played 500 Zoom recently. Mm -hmm. um because i'm also doing a session with him like this and he uh after the session he checked out the preflop ranges and i think he got pretty frustrated because he has to play so tight <laughs> yeah it's it's actually very very tight right i i took a look at at, at, at cash game ranges how far how far package. apart was i from these charts Host. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't looking at all your preflop decisions but honestly like all the the, the most hands that i looked at it seemed like you had some reasonable honestly like a lot of your play was pretty reasonable there's like a little bit of nuance and i like yeah we, we'll just talk about it it's like nice so yeah guys you you they can see my screen right mm -hmm. yeah so these are the different these are the different cash game um ranges that we have down here and we have run three different sims so far like we're actually running a lot of sims while we're speaking mm -hmm. um so they'll be coming out soon and the important thing for the people watching is just that the rake is different right so i think this is 50 zoom then 100 zoom 200 zoom rake and there's going to be significant dif significant uh, differences what? in in the ranges what happens with increased rake with with yeah, so that's yeah, so um, yeah, I talk a lot of a lot about these stuff, these things in, in the bundle that's upcoming. Um, but I like the main thing is just that you just have to play a lot tighter. There's um, less flatting going on because so on most sides, just on GG, um, I think it's the only one where there's no rake free flop. It's like the no flop, no drop policy, mm -hmm. and that means that uh, you benefit from actually taking down the pot pre-flop because it's not raked mm -hmm. and because of that with the no flop no drop three betting gets better mm -hmm. but once once the flop once the flop is getting raked then uh you can actually start flatting like three betting just gets a little bit worse flatting like mm -hmm. it's just it's just a worse situation overall um so yeah mainly just tighter less calling um you're like that's also the thing that's pretty interesting is that you're going to notice that uh, queens and jacks are going to be five bet jammed a lot more across the board at higher rank environments than 
than otherwise. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you do a lot of flatting with those hands, and yeah. So yeah, I think here I have like the big blind defense range mm -hmm. versus under the gun, and I think as an empty yeah, <laughs> I think as an MTT player when you see this, you just kind of go, like, what is, what is this? Is this some three bidding range? Small blind risk, but no. Yeah, I mean this 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 is tighter than we're supposed to play versus an under the gun three x with an ante actually like like we never wow. fold ace 10 mm. um so <laughs> that's like yeah <laughs> yeah and and guys this is as i said this is going to get better this is going to get better as the rake as the rake gets um the rake gets lower mm -hmm. okay so for you this is probably not significantly better but uh, yeah <laughs> no, so, it's so not. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's an incentive for everyone watching to get to high stakes because you get lower rake and you can play more hand. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, are you sure this looks almost the same? Um, uh, it, it, there should be a little bit of a difference. Like, let's look at, we, we shouldn't try to find mistakes because otherwise we're just saying that. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm kidding. So, uh, Jax here has a small, like, if we look at the Jax rebidding frequency, it's like, mm -hmm. what is this, five or 10%? And let's compare it here. Let's hope that this going to be different yeah okay so here it's only flooded which is exactly yeah against what i just said <laughs> but uh <laughs> but yeah there's a, there's a lot of factors coming into play overall over what i said should be true mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so small changes based on the rake and then sizings are also a thing right so with more rake you benefit more from taking down the pot preflop so if you like playing micro stakes you probably want to raise 3x3 might be a bit better than min raising for example and as we get to higher stakes, we actually see smaller sizes being used as well. Mm -hmm. So, so essentially, um, the more rake, the more you're going to want to be playing a a tighter, but like entering the pot more aggressively, like, yeah. like with three bets and, and raises and big raises, because you're trying to take the pot down pre flop. Cool. Exactly. All yeah. right. All right. So let's get to um, let's get to your hand, shall we? Absolutely. Okay, this was wrong. Um, no people know my Spotify. Okay. Ooh. So um, yeah, I wanted to. So guys, basically what happened is uh, Abe, Abe played like one thousand two hundred hands at two hundred zoom. I think you got some highest. Like, you had like two hands at five k, right? Uh yeah. And then I was like, wait, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah i was uh, like yeah i looked at all his hands and he had like two twins at 5k <laughs> yeah, yeah i, I, I like yeah i sat and i was like yeah i'll play some five and then i was like wait why am i learning at 5k and so i just sat out <laughs> yeah yeah good idea yeah. yeah i think 500 zoom is a nice level for you guys like you and lex i told him as well um because because the the wrecks are somewhat good at 500 like okay the wrecks are good at 500 zoom right and you're going to have some tougher spots, so it's going to be more interesting. But 200 zoom, I would say. For me personally, I always found the jump from 100 zoom to 200 zoom, I think, a bit a bit larger of a difference than 200 to 500. But maybe that's mm -hmm. just my experience. And, you know, okay. I thought I was going to I thought I was going to go in here and wreck shot. But the truth is, is that like we're playing different games now. You know, it's it's like it's like boxing and MMA. You know, it's it's they're they're. They're very, very yeah. similar. They have things in common, but but they're not they're not the same. Right. That's true. Okay, so I looked at your two hundred zoom hands mainly, and you also I, I marked a couple, and you also um, you also wrote me a couple of points which I can't open right now because I don't want to show my Discord messages. Um, oh man, all these hands, want... all these hands are so brutal. These are like the worst <laughs> ones, dude. Oh man. Um. <laughs> yeah. So um, you, you have to you have to remind me what you wanted to talk about. I think there was one thing about like initially you said you wanted to understand better how to call down right in big blind spots. Or... Um yeah, like basically defending actually not so much calling yes, but like defending my like when I check twice call turn nodes things like that like 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 def defending spots that involve me checking essentially like yeah just defending my different checking ranges and also spots where like i show up with really wide ranges where i don't know how i can how i can pick my bluffs because i have so many like hmm. like multi-way where it's been checked down all right but this this one i already know is a mistake but yeah let's let's go into the hand yeah let's just go through it just just try to uh 
remind me of the stuff that you want to talk about if there's something okay sounds good okay okay so uh yeah i, I marked them yesterday i think i had a look, look at stuff. Me i'm just thing. gonna what's gonna happen is i'm gonna probably ask you a lot of questions because like for everyone watching this is actually my first interaction with george yeah. so we just got to know each other already vibing and yeah so i'm going to try to I'm going to try to understand a little bit how you approach the game. Mm -hmm. That's also why I asked you if you saw poker like chess, by the way. So I kind of gained an insight into you, um, how, you, how you think about it. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the way that I try to view poker is from a, a GTO perspective where I'm constantly looking at the newest models and then mm -hmm. um, trying to figure out how to exploit from there. And right. But I also have another perspective where I like to... I, my goal, like, I'm willing to try something and be wrong, like, and then look at it later. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of always experimenting with stuff, and I think that that can get me in trouble, of course. But it's, it's how I learn. Right. So you're gonna see some, some funny hands yeah. for sure. Yeah. And, and, uh, <laughs> <it> like, <laughs> but, uh, like, that's oh, one of these is a misclick though, for what it's worth. The queen four was a misclick on the river, but, uh. Yeah, you know, like, so a lot of the stuff I'm willing to try just so you can tell me that it's bad. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought, I thought so. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> like, that's good though. Well, I think, I think it'll be fun for you as a teacher. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Okay. Yeah. So the way that I approach the game is uh, I approach it from like a purely fundamental perspective. So I like, I, I want to have a clear thought process behind every single decision that I make. And, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, my bad. Yeah. One, one, one thing, the yeah, one thing that I just I'm gonna get out of the way is that like when people when people often have like this whole discussion about GTO versus exploitative, and the way I teach it, the way it actually is, is that there's not really a distinction between these two things. And exploitative, exploitative, what the way we want to think about it is essentially just being a bit more precise about the parameters that you're using in your sim, for example, by not locking your opponents, by not locking the assumptions that you have about your opponents, but ultimately you still want to play game theory optimal solution based on these additional locks. Yeah, I mean, understand that that we are we are we are on the same page there. Basically, like when we are at on a GTO solution where we we figured out the that the solve for any spot or that both sides are maximally exploiting one another. So mm -hmm. it's it's actually yeah. like when people are like is it GTO or are you or or are you playing like like exploitively it's like well i use gto to exploit accurately um mm. and and that's 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 always been my percept like my my process and um everything i do i i just look in solvers and check it with like so that's why i'm kind of excited to approach cash because i've never really put much time or effort into cash i mean i i think i'm a lifetime loser in cash because I've, I've played maybe yeah one percent of the cash that like i've played mtts right maybe no no right. not even point oh point oh one so right. i'm interested in, in in approaching learning with you because this is like, like your style matches up with mine and i think the fact that we yeah. have solvers and tools now means that i can like get good quickly hopefully you know for sure yeah i think so too like as i said from what i've seen from your play it all seemed like it was following a fundamental base before mm -hmm. we get into the hand, I'm just going to throw something out of, uh, out there again. Might be interesting for the chat. I think a lot of the terminology is like a lot of a lot of the talk about GTO exploitative and all that stuff uh, comes from a misunderstanding of the actual terminology behind game theory. And I think what people refer to the mo most of the time is the Nash equilibrium situation a solution. So Nash is like the actual solution, like the perfect solution, and there might even be multiple Nashs, but the the perfect solution um, that everyone is essentially talking about when they want to talk about GTO. And Nash is a game theory optimal solution. But you can also have a game theory optimal solution of a smaller game. So you reduce the entire game. For example, in Pio, we do that all the time when we set our parameters. We reduce the entire game, and Pio then calculates the game theory optimal solution for that reduced game. So that's still a game theory optimal solution. And then when we note lock, it's going to recalculate based on the assumptions that we're now putting in, and it's still going to be a game theory optimal solution. So at the end of the day, we're always trying to play game theory optimal. Mm -hmm. One last thing 
that people mistake a lot is that you, you don't balance to balance. You never take a less yeah. EV line to for sure just to be tricky. Like <laughs> you're doing. Yeah. All right, guys, I've got some pretty incredible news. We have brought all one-off videos on bbzpoker.com down to bundle level pricing. That means 10 bucks a video. So the bundles have been so successful that we decided to rationalize the pricing of all of our video content to the same level as the bundles. So all BBZ Poker videos are now 10 bucks. You can get Ape Styles for 10 bucks. You can get me, you can get Lucky Fish, you can get Yargo, you can get Finton, you can get Spraggy, all for 10 bucks. I'll see you on bbzpoker.com. If you're, if you're taking multiple options with a part of your range, it's because they are indifferent to one another. Um, Absolutely. Let's, let's move. Yeah, let's, let's see the hand, man. All right, let's, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Okay, so, so here you just check call. I think this is pretty standard. Mm -hmm. So um, we, could, we could go through this spot in depth, but uh, what about I would the say we would have like... Yeah. I keep interrupting you. I'm a bad student. Sorry. <laughs> it's also because of the delay. It's also, I think that there's a small delay on Zoom, so we, we don't know when we finish our send. Mm -hmm. Did you want to say when we, if we had 10-8 of clubs? Yeah. Yeah, then 10-8 of clubs basically is a little bit better of a hand for two reasons. Like, and that's like, you, you kind of always have to think about it in these two ways. On one hand, you, you have more equity because of the backdoor draw. But on the other hand, you also block his continuing range. And there's like mm -hmm. these two factors that come into play. And sometimes we only look at one or mix them up. Because it's um, better, do we, do we possibly ever raise it? Or with eight, or is yeah, it I more would, of a... I would, I would say, yeah, I would say so. So the, in general, like the, if, you, if you think about it from like an infinite iteration kind of perspective, what happens is that we, we try to raise these kind of hands. And then we, we figure out that maybe we're losing money by raising them too much. So we raise them less. Mm -hmm. And what we'll notice is that 10, 10, 10 of clubs is probably going to try to raise a little bit and realize that raising is okay and just not too much. Mm -hmm. So I would say that if I would look at a sim in this spot, I would think that 10 of clubs might have like a small frequency raise versus mm -hmm. the larger sizing in general. You don't really want to raise too much. So the yeah. only hands that I want, yeah, the hands that I want to be thinking about raising here would be ace jack plus perhaps pocket nines kind of. You you might have some jacks in your range as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those hands would also be flatting some when he starts like indicating that he wants to be betting a polarized range. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so, so yeah, I, I would still want to have some raising ranges and then you want to think about which kind of hands you want to be raising with. Mm -hmm. And usually you start with draw. So you have like all the broadways and stuff, but an open mm -hmm. end is a great draw. Mm -hmm. And you, you also have flush draws. So what, what I think would happen would be like, uh, 10 8 of clubs would have a small frequency raise. 10 8 of hearts might have mm -hmm. a tiny frequency raise, but it's also not the greatest and to mm -hmm. put more money in with. And we're just not going to be raising too much here because they're already putting lots of money in the pot. We would be super polarized for our value range for raising, I think, right? Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So ace jack plus, I think like ace nine would maybe like raise a small frequency and jack nine mm -hmm. uh, in, in a similar vein. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, so then we see the turn. Uh, you check. I think so far pretty standard. And... Uh oh. Okay, so just, just, just as far as like, like my thought process, and this is this is very, very basic, right? Which is like, I can't call this, so it's probably just a fold. And then, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then I'm like, but like, what do I bluff raise with here? And then like, I thought maybe low frequency, so. I rolled and then uh oh. like <laughs> well okay the thing is I actually like like on this one I was like you know what I'm just gonna do it <laughs> but like I, I think it's a zero percent check raise here this is just too too strong but I thought having uh the 10 might be important and also on some rivers blocking missed flush draws as my bluff but I think it's just too weak and they're too strong like and, and yeah and, like that's what's going on here, right? Yeah, hundred percent. So basically, essentially, just what you said. It's like a lot of people make this mistake, and I think uh, at some point it got proliferated in the poker poker coaching community and learning videos that you have like a hand that is too weak to call, and you start raising it. <laughs> yes. um, ab ab yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just absolutely not how it works. Sometimes it might seem like that's the case, but it's not. And <laughs> in this case, in this case, your hand, your hand is just too weak to call. You just, uh, you just fold it. What I would be like, you definitely want to have some blockers to his continuing range. And like, I would say the 10 of hearts isn't like that big of a deal. No. So usually 
like usually you would actually have clubs of spades in your hand yeah and also you could also do stuff with king queen at some frequency yeah, and, and th well. this is going to be such a low frequency play i think that you're going to want to do it with your best blockers your best bluffs and and with anything and so this was more just like this will be fun to look at later <laughs> but 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 like yeah i i i thought almost certainly this is just gonna be a fold though harris five yeah, says i like, just jam <laughs> uh, no man yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> so for good. everyone watching the only the only hands the only hands you really want to raise is like queen 10 and then maybe you have some 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 jacks or nines i would that like that even like, i think i have bit. a sim i mean I, I have something close to this in i have all right so it was ace jack nine with, is it the ace and jack of spades uh ace jack yeah ace and jack of spades nine of clubs king of clubs single raise pot big blind versus mp okay so they actually do have this polarized sizing sometimes but in general if you look it seems to be more around a smaller size call is this um is this og2o trainer.com sesh um yeah this is this is a place a, a a trainer that i'm uh yeah this is this is the the gto trainers cash game product that i've never really pushed but but like i have access to it because i i sell sim or i use their sims for mtts but right. yeah so if we so look if at we this is this is our check raise range right first of all 10 8 suited is uh you know folding <laughs> like for sure just big big fold even queen jacks folding right so yeah and you said something about king queen maybe or where do you yeah i said king queen like maybe we could like we could maybe think about king queen raising uh if, if we wanted if we were desperate to look for bluffs but mm -hmm. uh, yeah just low raising frequency on a turn overall i think it, right it looks like they just come from um blush draws for the most part and right. like oh yeah uh, that makes sense yeah yeah I was just curious because I was like, hmm, what's yeah, an ace nine one disclaimer. I, I wanted I want to tell one disclaimer to everyone watching about Sims in general is that uh yeah, I don't I've never looked at these Sims that uh, John is using right now. Um, maybe they are legit, but uh yeah, it's really important that you're aware of the parameters that your sim uses because they greatly influence the results that you're getting. Yeah, absolutely. And sims can be kind of weird sometimes. Like like if you put like a slightly like if you put ranges a certain way or you put them the way that you think they are like th mm. they'll they'll target a specific part of somebody's range sometimes you know like like they'll be really really finicky and nuanced but yeah you were right it's, this is just a fold and i actually am more interested in hearing your thought process than i am hearing or like yeah. looking at what a what a sim does but i i did i was curious where the bluffs came from so i just want to take a look but yeah, I check raise yeah. because I'm a goon. Yeah, you went for the check raise. Uh, he called, and then you jammed the revive. So I get the no, I, I didn't jam actually revive. here. I uh, oh oh right okay. I thought oh, interesting. I thought though that my 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 turn check raise range. I thought that there was a, enough that that if you want to think about the equity of my turn check raise range, I didn't think Queen Ten necessarily wanted to slam. I didn't think mm. a lot of my um like two pair combos wanted to slam yep so i figured that this yeah, for sure two pair two pair for sure doesn't yeah wanna, any like sets doesn't, doesn't want yeah. to bet here yeah uh i mean maybe uh, yeah I, two pair wouldn't wouldn't a check raise actually i mean a set i'm sorry but uh it, yeah. it basically the bottom of my value range is probably a set um and uh maybe even not that let's <laughs> i'm not even sure yeah i don't yeah, even know so you would you i think blocking here would pro like if you had sets in your turn raising range and blocking on the roof might be good checking would be good i think the sizing is starting to get a little bit too big but uh you know what i'm noticing though is that i think we're like a little like similar in the same line of thoughts so that's mm -hmm. basically what i'm taking away like the way that you're approaching it is already similar to mine so I'll give a quick disclaimer to the chat, maybe. Like, I don't know what the level is of the viewers. There's probably like a large variety of people. So um, we are, like the, the way we're approaching these spots in general, me and John, is that we're trying to think more about our entire range, what we're doing with, how our range looks like, what other hands we have in this kind of situation so that we can build good strategies. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you think that the sizing of this nature would like make sense with our range here? Uh, I am going to okay, check so, the same so, after, but yeah, so I would like, I would, I would, okay. So do you want to, you want to know the answer? If I would think that you like, if we're like in this kind of GDO version of Piosim yeah. and you played like flop and turn correctly. Okay. Yeah. I would like to know what you think your river bet sizes should be, um, on this river. If we have like a block and a shove, or if this sort of middling sizing makes sense, right. um, for, for, and usually the way that I determine our different bet sizes has to do with basically the different equity categories of my value range. Like, yeah. okay. And so like, of course, I'm not just going to like bet small when I have a, a, a weekend and bet, bet big when I have a big, but like in general, that actually kind of works out as long as you do some mixing. So yeah, but I generally try to have one, like two or three sizes on the river and based on the equity of the worst hand in my value ranges, basically. Right. The equity of the worst hand of your value range. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah so to answer your question, in, if you played this hand correctly until now, uh, I would say that we definitely have a jam sizing. So some of our flashes just want to jam here. Um, I think queen 10 is like, yeah, depending on what kind of sizing options you have, my initial assumption would be that we would have a small size and, a, and an all-in. Uh, it's possible that we have some of this as well. I was thinking but... we might not have an all-in too because we don't necessarily check raise king x of spades. Um, so I was thinking that like that we may not have an all-in because we actually don't have the nuts ever. But it would it would still it would still be okay. It would still yeah. be okay if we don't have the nuts as long as our opponent's uh, range is not too strong on the river. Uh, we can we can still jam, and then that's why I checked. It's around. Like it's, it's less than 1.5 x pot, so I, I think it would still be fine to jam some like our, our some of our flashes on the river. All right, I'm gonna check the the as if we played this correctly. I know I didn't play the hand correctly in the first place, but we're gonna call. Yeah. And the river was a diamond, like in this sim. What was it again? Are you, are you checking it right now? Yeah. Okay, so the river, yeah. So ace jack of spades, then king nine of clubs on the turn, and two of spades uh, completes the flush on the flop. All right, so we've got, that's so weird. So equity, if we're looking at equity here, we do have like, I mean, we're, we have such a small amount of our range here, but it looks yeah, like it's actually that's... choosing on average with that, like these small sizes. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I guess it's because, yeah, it's, it's actually because of the equity of, of, of Queen 10 offsuit. And it also has some jamming, right? Um, no jamming. No jamming at all. No jamming at all. <laughs> mm, okay. uh, that's what... So if you're looking at the pot here at 61, it has the option to go all in, the option to bet 40, the option to bet 20. It looks like if we had my hand, though, that we were to... But yeah, I'm not really quite sure why, but like I have... This is... Like what, what I'm thinking right now is that like one, one possible explanation is because... So opponent's river range is pretty condensed right now, and on, on like these flush boards, it's actually pretty significant when you block a flush or not. So maybe when our flushes are too high cat heavy, which they might be in this scenario, mm -hmm. um, then we block a lot of their calling range when we jam those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also again I think it is related to to um, the equity of a lot of our value range, right? If you look, um, this is from Will Tipton's. Look, we, he did some proofs around bet sizing and, and equity in the relationship. I'm just putting that up on my screen right now. But yeah, I think that may be part of it. But yeah, one of the things that PO's taught me is to not like always jam just because we have a pot size bet, even though most of the time when we have a polarized range, like we're going to just have at least one part of it that goes all in, you know, in mm. place. But like I, I just I thought here because of Queen Ten being such a big part of our check raise range that it didn't make sense to shove for the main part. <clears throat> um, this, this actually brings me to something pretty interesting that I, I I wanted to ask you is so you said that you have three sizings in most spots. Do you kind of do you go at them on the fly? Like do you choose them on the fly depending on the spot, or do you already have like a set pool of like sizes? Arranged I've been... already out of which you choose. <laughs> That's actually, I want to know what you do there. Yeah. 
I'm dynamic, basically. Like, like basically, it's like two or three sizes, but it depends. Like, those three sizes are constantly cha- shifting. But, like, I was like, dang, how am I going to teach this? Because I'm like, well, because I've looked at so many different sims from di- with different sizes. So, I'm like, I got, like, a, a teeny bet, a small bet, a middle bet, a middle big bet, a big bet, an over bet. Like, I'm like, dang, I need to, <laughs> I need to yeah. like, simplify this a bit. Yeah, so what I do is... Um... What I do, what I recommend all my clients and students to do is to to have a, a pool of sizes. I would recommend everyone in chat to do this as well. Like, and this is regardless MTT or cash actually. So uh, you can you can have like three sizes or four sizes or two sizes that you that you always can choose from. And then I would say that in every split you shouldn't have more than three either. I had a time. So so one ex- as an example, you could say that your pool of sizes would be. 25%, 50%, 100%, and 200%. Mm-hmm. And then depending on the spot, you would choose like three of them. So you say, okay, on the flop, on this flop, on this next time, I'm going to have 25%, mm-hmm. uh, 50%, and, and 200% or whatever. And on this spot, I'm going to have 50%, 100%, 200%. That's what I would do. Because if you want to play a really theoretically sound game, then the, one of the most important things is that you actually have some awareness of how your range looks like in a given spot.